If you have a Bible today, I'd love for you to open it to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, huge help, comes right after 1 Corinthians. So find it your way there, and we're continuing. This is the last Sunday in our series called At the Crossroads, and we'll be looking at a passage today that was the passage, the second message I ever preached at Trinity Church when I was candidating. Come back next week for the third just kidding. People are like, man, he's run out of material. Five years is it. He just starts recycling stuff. Just joking. We'll be back in the book of John next week, picking up our series then. But today I have a special intent of why I want to share this message with you a second time. And we'll see that as it begins to unfold in our time together today. If you have our app, you can open up your digital notes there. If you want some notes, they should be in the back otherwise. And then we'll dive in in just a moment. Let me remind you about our congregational meeting today. This is something we do annually today at four o'clock right here in the worship center. Let me give you a couple of details, by the way. So when you arrive, you'll know kind of what we'll be doing. In the lobby, when you come today, it'd be best if you came through our main double doors, because as you come through the lobby, we'll have a list of members, and we'll ask you to just check in, and you'll receive a ballot at that point. Everyone is welcome today, if you're a member or not, and you're welcome to come and attend. Obviously, if you're not a member, you won't be voting, but you can be a part of our meeting together today. But come through if you're a member, get a ballot in the lobby. When you come through, we'll have three other things for you today, an agenda for our meeting, a proposed budget that was shared two weeks ago at our budget preview meeting that we also do annually, and then our annual report. And you will just appreciate Chris Petnack and uh, Mindy Sames have done a great job putting all that together, and we'll be able to share some of that with you where we've been and where we're going. So all of that today at four o'clock, please make it a point uh, to join us. All right. This meeting today, uh, the others that we have had recently uh, in terms of our conflict resolution meeting back in um, uh, two weeks ago, two Saturdays ago, as well as our preview budget meeting, had opportunities for lots of discourse and discussion. Today's meeting will be pretty straightforward about just looking at the issues that we're in and making a couple presentations. All right. Well, here's what I want to do today. I told you I wanted to share with you again a message that I gave five years ago. I want you to be able, as you listen today, to note, I will tell you at any point when I'm adding something that wasn't there originally. But if you don't hear me say that, that means this is exactly what I shared with you as a church family when I was candidating to become the lead pastor at Trinity Church. Back then, five years ago, I started by saying that I was tempted to preach a very safe message a message that would just make us feel kind of warm and fuzzy about so many good things we could talk about. But I felt like that would be a wrong representation of who I am because that's what I was wanting to do was to make myself known to you as much as I could because it would be that next Sunday, Father's Day of 2016, that you were going to vote one way or the other about me. Now, I shared with you last week, you already know whose I am. We talked about how important it is that you would know that I am a son of of the king. And I've been adopted by God and that has changed everything in my life. But today, what I want to share with you is how I bleed. How I bleed and what's most important to me as we live out this mission. Remember what we said last week is we talked about that once we have been adopted into God's family, that we engage in quote the family business. Meaning that we engage in the mission that he's been on all along, all throughout uh, human history to redeem and to reconcile people to make them his own. And we get to be involved in that same venture now that we have been adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. We said it this way last week, Philippians chapter two, verse 22, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Paul was using apprenticeship language. And even though Timothy wasn't his blood relative, wasn't his even adopted son, he said, he's been like a son to me and that I have been able to apprentice him in this uh, idea of living out this mission of sharing the gospel with people. Jesus, when he came to Zacchaeus's house, he declared his mission clearly when he said in Luke 19, for the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost. And praying for the 11, Judas had already left at that point. But on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus shared how that mission would be translated not just to these 11, but to those who would follow as a result of their testimony. 
John 17, as you, Father, sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. There's a, a mission at hand. And once we become a part of the family, we join this venture of worldwide rescue, of Jesus seeking and saving the lost. And we've said it a lot in our study in the Gospel of John. It's not ours to save anyone. That is purely a thing that is on the supernatural level that God does in hearts. But we get this rich opportunity to be a people of influence, that people might hear the gospel through us and then God might be working and they might come to know him in faith. And that happens best when we seek to be influential in our relational worlds on Jesus's behalf. On a dangerous seacoast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station the building was just a hut, but there, and there was only one boat, but a few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea with no thought for themselves, went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area, they wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. New boats were bought and new crews were trained the little life-saving station grew. Some members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as a first refuge of those saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put new or better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it sort of as a, of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in this club's decorations, and there was a miniature lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and some of them had black skin, and some had yellow skin. The beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee uh, immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities since they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives, the lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. They did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same, old, the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most people drown. I will just say today, and I said it then, I've seen far too many churches turn a corner and forget and lose the plot. Forget why they exist and forget what they're here for. I have attended them growing up all my life in church, and I've even served at one. I missed the point, and as a result, failed to live out the mission that God had in front of them. And so that's why it's so important that we don't lose the plot. That's why it's so important that we remind ourselves what we're here for, and that we don't become a people missing it, caught up with our own preferences, but instead of people who are staffed, we staff this life-saving station with rescued survivors centered around the mission of life-saving. So rather than hear me talk more and more about the mission of every Christian in every church, let's see what God says about it. First off in your notes, number one, our motivation comes from an extravagant love. Our motivation comes from an extravagant love. First, some context of where we're jumping into in 2 Corinthians 5. Chapter 4 is all about Paul's sufferings in 2 Corinthians. And as he's walking this church that he's, he dearly loves but is so full of dysfunction, He's reminding them that even the things that he has faced are worth it because in the light of the scope of heaven, the hope of heaven that he has, one day it will be validated. 
Beginning in chapter 5, he begins talking about the heavenly dwelling, giving some incredibly powerful words of what we can expect and what heaven will be like. And then we pick it up here in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, watch this, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him, for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Motivation has always been a very interesting thing to me. In that, that there was a season in my life, a long season, where I believed I could understand people's motivations for doing what they did. And I came to find out that nine times out of ten, I was wrong. So I just stopped. It's just not a, a profitable venture to try to understand someone else's motives apart from sitting down and talking to them and understanding them from the horse's mouth, as it were. Then I realized also in my own life that there have been numerous things over the course of my life that were even righteous pursuits, but knowing my own motivation, what was moving me to engage was coming from a heart of pride. So even my own motivations, I've recognized the mixedness of them and how sometimes they just cannot be trusted. What Paul says here is the extravagant love of Jesus embodied in his death on the cross. It is our motivation to no longer live for ourselves, but to live according to his mission and his desire. The word translated here compels. We're compelled by this love. It's described as pressure that produces action. Pressure that produces action. So like when you're hangry. You heard me right. When you're hangry, you're hungry to the point, argh, frustrated, that is a pressure, and what you deal with that hangry is a double-double. <laughs> That's action, okay? So pressure that leads to action, you deal with hangry by getting filled up. To abandon our agendas for the life of a better one. To abandon our desires of how we want to live our lives, but to instead engage Jesus' agenda for our lives. To see our lives through his lens, no longer regarding others from a worldly point of view, but to see them as Jesus sees them. And how does he see them? But a people that he died for, a people that he loves, a people that he's paid the price that they would be redeemed. And once they have put their faith in Christ, like us, they're new creations, just like what we've become known as. So think of it this way. Imagine there's a commercial realtor who is uh, trying to sell uh, an old warehouse. And this warehouse is broken down, and there's a potential buyer there that day. And, and the realtor's making these promises. Hey, I know those windows are broken. We'll get them fixed. I know there's a hole in the ceiling. We'll make sure that gets patched up. I know that there's doors missing. We'll, we'll take care of those as well. And as he continues to go on about all these things that is going to be refurbished, the potential owner just says, time out. Uh, let me just stop you. I'm not buying this building for the building, but for the land. I'm going to demo the whole thing. Don't worry about any of that, because what I want this for is uh, amazingly, extravagantly better than what it is now. That's what God has done looking at your life. Rather than trying to fix all the broken pieces, rather than trying to kind of put some wax on the outside, some veneer to make it look better, when you came to Christ, Jesus came in and demolished. Demolished the aspects of your life that were just so ill-fitting. The aspects of your life that were so not pleasing to him. The aspects of your life that were bound on an eternity apart from him. And he's rebuilding on the land. He's building on the foundation of Christ. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And he's building this brand new building that is going to be so honoring to him to fulfill an entirely better purpose. God was interesting, interested in purchasing you, not based on what could be patched up, but to redeem you to be the building he was going to build for the new purpose he wanted you to accomplish in your life. That is great news. That is amazing news because you know you, I know me, and to have a life that has hope and a future and purpose is so exciting. 
That exchange from living for yourself and living out Jesus' purpose is what the rest of our passage is about today. Let's continue on. In your notes number two, we are God's plan A for rescuing the world. We are God's plan A for rescuing the world. We continue chapter five, verse 18. All this, all this idea of, of God making people new, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is what it is, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. And look at this great phrase, not counting people's sins against them, no longer keeping the ledger. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So first things first, Paul begins by saying, all this is from God, who has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Paul wants the Corinthian Christians to know that there's not some guy in management that he's reporting to. He wants them to know that this doesn't come of some human origin, of some tact to take. This comes from the top. This comes from this newly adopted father who's instructing his children how to live with purpose. God had given them this role, had committed the message of reconciliation to them. Even if they hadn't necessarily asked for it, he's now commissioning them with this responsibility nonetheless. This is God's doing. It's important to look at the word reconciliation. Take a look up on the screen. My big fat theological dictionary noted it this way. Whenever estrangement or enmity is overcome and unity restored. Man, that is a take it to the bank definition. Reconciliation is whenever estrangement or enmity is overcome and unity restored. That means that estrangement and enmity is present. It means that that's already there. That's part of the arrangement. That's part of the relationship. It begins not at zero, but negative. Estrangement, enmity. But in that, to be reconciled is when those things are made whole. When enmity and estrangement are accounted for and unity is restored. So what Paul is saying is there was a problem in our relationship to a holy God, this heavenly father couldn't just go out and say, we said last week, moving people from created beings to ch cherished children, unless there was something in the gap, something in the way that made that possible. And that way was purely done, wholly completed through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Yea, God. Yea, God, that's what happened in that space. That's how reconciliation was provided. Not by us being more externally moral. Not by us keeping more rules. Not by us trying harder to somehow be acceptable to God. God went first. And that to me is what is so profoundly amazing. See, when we see this word reconcile, we realize that has an incredible value vertically. But man, that has so much to say horizontally as well of the kind of people that we're called to. This word reconcile is not a Bible only or church only word. It's a word that we should be using in our relationships all the time. It's what you do when you violated another and want to make an attempt to make it right. Maybe it's a family member or a coworker, an employer or a neighbor. The wild thing is that when we talk about being reconciled or being made right, the onus is on the offending party. The one who has offended, if you blew it, you do what it takes to make it right. That's where it begins. It could be an apology or asking forgiveness. In some cases, it could be paying for the damage done, literally in dollars. I threw that ball through your window, I need to get it fixed. That's what being reconciled to someone looks like. But whatever the price is that, that needs to be paid, the offender does that in order for the relationship to be restored, to be reconciled. But here's the wild thing. This is the wild thing about the character and the nature of God. We were the ones who failed. We were the ones living out the nature and the action of sinners. 
We've put estrangement and enmity in the relationship, but even though we are the ones who even through religion try to go first and make it right, God the offended, he comes. He's the one who provides the price to bring us together and make things aligned. Just grasp that for a moment. Someone in your life has wronged you. And in wronging you, there is a, a, a reconciliation that needs to happen. And rather than you waiting for them to come to you, rather than you waiting them to pay the price to make it right, you're the one who goes first. And actually not just says it's okay, but actually pays whatever difference there is in the relationship and makes the relationship whole. Who but God does that? Because I'm pretty sure in our humanity, we really struggle with action and behaviors on that front. What are we to do with this great news, this great reality that has been made for us? First of all, we thank him. And you've done that today so powerfully in praise. These songs today have such a, a great anthem of God, of your faithfulness. God, there's joy in this place. We want to lift your name. I could keep singing that first song, like have that on repeat on Spotify for me all day long. I just love it. God, your, your goodness. I could sing of your goodness. So we thank him. But second, we tell others who do not yet know that God has done this great thing for them too. We become his spokespeople. We become his ambassadors. That's what this passage is saying. This amazingly wonderful message of hope and reconciliation, it's true. Like we looked at last week, it's not a fairy tale. God has done this on our, on the world's behalf. And it floods our hearts with joy and anticipation. But the problem is that's often where it stops. God, thank you for being so amazing to me. But am I moved to want to share this incredibly great news with others who still need it as well? We're so excited about being rescued that we fail to pay attention to the fact that there are others lost all around us. And as awesome as it is, I was able to be there on Wednesday night at the Pavoni's or, yeah, prayer event. It was such a rich time and so many people gathered to say, God, would you use them? Would you do a work in Portugal in such powerful ways? And I love, this has been on their heart for years. But I want to remind each and every one of us what I prayed for Daniel and Hannah then. I say to all of us today, Daniel and Hannah are not going to start being people of influence when they go to Portugal. They have been being that here. Because that's what God calls us to. We don't have to go over oceans to find people who need the goodness of who God is. This picture is one that's been referenced a couple times in the last month. And you'll note, this is the one that hangs in my office, you'll note that the people on this platform, on this dock, as you note them, you'll note that most of them are doing life stuff. A guy is sweet talking, a girl, another guy's playing music, another guy, you can tell this picture's dated, he's got a boom box, most of us. Anyone under 30 has no idea what that thing is. It's like, what's that growing off of his shoulder? That's crazy. People lifting weights, people at dinner, people making business transactions. They're going through life safe on the dock. But you notice a couple people doing some really odd things. Guys, especially over here in this corner, a guy reaching down, another guy reaching out. Pull the picture back a little bit, and this is the fuller picture of what this painting is a painting called Who Cares? A simple question that is before all of us, God, you have saved us and you have placed us in a rich, secure relationship in who we are in Christ. We are safe. I gotta tell you, the first time I saw this picture, it just broke me. Uh, not because I was thinking of you or other people, I just had to look in the mirror and think about me. And the sad thing is for most of my life, the guy on the far left, that's the guy I've associated with the most. Sitting on the dock, safe, completely aware of everything around him because he's actually fishing into the waters where people are drowning. 
This, this painting, by the way, its story comes from a gentleman in the early 80s who came across the first speech ever given by the founder of the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army was being inaugurated. And he read that message 150 years later and drew this painting, simply asking the question, are we going to be a people who don't just care emotionally, but care with our lives? That we exchange our agenda for a better one. It's called being God's ambassador to your world, allowing God to make his appeal through you. And as God's ambassador of reconciliation, you are his plan A. Catch this today. There is no plan B. Finally, today, number three, the most effective way of rescuing the world is to begin with your world. The most effective way of rescuing the world is to begin with your world. One thing that popped off the page to me when I was studying this passage initially is I was processing the word ambassador. The word ambassador 2,000 years ago in the Greek means exactly what it means today. It means someone from one land or region is sent on behalf of the one who gives leadership there to be a person of influence and to be a person of voice somewhere else. So that, that word is same, same 2,000 years later. And what I was processing about that word was the reality that an ambassador going into a new place has no power and no authority. Think about ambassadors that we send to countries all over our world or those that are sent to the United States. When they're here, they have no power, they have no authority, they have no rank. They don't get to make people do anything. All that they have is influence. And they have instructions of what they've been sent to do. The, the place, the land from where they come has given them directives. And as they go into that new space, they're called to be influential towards those directives. They're called to be a people who are able to be winsome. The people who would represent well where they come from and would be able to gain a voice to be heard. How true, how very true that is for us as God's ambassadors of reconciliation. We have no authority over the people that God has placed into our lives, but we have amazingly great news. And what we do is we leverage the power of relational, intentional influence in the lives that we're connected to. This is the dynamic that changed everything for me. I was candidating at a church. I'm almost 32 years old. I am a Bible college graduate. I am a seminary graduate. I've been in ministry for 10 years. And I'm candidating at a church and I'm hearing them talk about the idea how God has called us to be his ambassadors and the way that we do that is through the influence of the people that God has supernaturally, strategically placed in our lives. I had never heard that before. I'd never connected that dot. You see, I had been outfitted with more than what I needed to be an ambassador of God in my world, but I'd failed to engage what I was built for primarily because I just didn't understand it. What does that even look like? A little camel asks his mother, which by the way, you know this is an illustration because camels don't talk, okay? <laughs> Mama, why have I got such big flat feet? She replies, well, darling, in the desert, you need big flat feet because the sand is soft and they help us to keep stable. The little camel goes away, but then comes back, Mama, why have I got such big eyelashes? Well, darling, in the desert, when there is a lot of wind and sand that gets thrown about in the air, we need big eyelashes to stop the sand from getting into our eyes. The little camel goes away, but later returns again. Mama, why have I got a hump on my back? Darling, out in the desert, we are sometimes without water for a long time. We've got the hump because it is designed to store a lot of water, and it helps us survive in the desert. The young camel goes away. He comes back one final time. Mama, I know why we have, why we have big, fat, flat feet. And I know why we have long eyelashes, and I know why we have a hump. But can you tell me, why do we live in this zoo? <laughs> and you see, that's what I feel like for so many of us, is the question we need to be asking. 
God, you've equipped me with everything I need. You might not have been to Bible college. You might not be a seminary grad. But you have a story. You have a story of how God's extravagant love met you and saved you and reconciled you. And I'm here to tell you today, God wants to use you. I think that's our biggest challenge because what we've done in our minds, we've said, God, you want to use the professionals. God, you want to use those you've uniquely gifted in evangelism. Let them go. It's going to be awesome. But me, God, I'm not good at that. And I'm surely not good at, hi, you've never met me before. Would you like to know Jesus? And that's what we've equated evangelism to. Short-term missions trips are going door to door. And we fail to see what's right in front of our faces. That God has placed people in your life. And he wants to use you to be a source of influence. He wants to use you to be a source of the way that you consistently pray for them. He wants to use you to be a source of someone who's looking for needs that you can meet. Who's earning the right to be heard. Who loves them deeply. It looks like this. Take a look at this slide. The Greeks called it an oikos, called it a relational world, those in your, quote, household. And it wouldn't necessarily refer to just those under your roof, but it's the people that you work with. It's friends, it's extended family members. It, it's people on your team, on your sports team. It, it's people that, uh, that is your mechanic, your hairdresser. People that have been placed uniquely in your life for the purpose of being a person who's intentional in your relationships. Please don't hear me today that what that means is that there's a gospel track that needs to get placed in every one of those hands this week. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is it begins with, God, would you break my heart for the people in my world who haven't yet put their faith in you and use me? God, I want to be used. God, I want to be a person that somehow is a part of their story of putting their faith in Christ. I know I can't save them. I know that I can't raise the dead because the Bible says we're all spiritually dead on arrival. God, you need to do that. But God, I would love to partner with you. God, I would love to be someone that would be a part of that equation in their lives. And, And when you think that might sound so out there and just so an intangible. Just go back to your own story. Go back to your parent who was praying for you and introducing you to the things of God from the earliest age. Go back to your coach who was influential in your life and coming to know Christ. Go back to your coworker. Go back to your grandparent. Go back to the people that God used in your life. Simple question, why wouldn't he want to use you in others? That's how this gospel message, that's how lives being reconciled keeps getting translated life to life. When I came to Trinity, I was looking over some of your statements when I was candidating, and one of them says, to empower believers to reach their world for Christ. That was before I got here. Today, we frame it this way, rooted in Jesus reaching your worlds. It's a simple recognition that you're supposed to go and tell. It's a simple recognition that when you feel like you're supposed to go and tell everybody, you won't tell anybody because it's so overwhelming. Begin with those that God has placed in your relational world. It's not that this is the only way to reach people with the gospel. It just continues to be the most effective. That's it. That's what I shared five years ago. Let me share with you some additional thoughts before we wrap up today. When we started this series in the beginning of June, not only did I communicate that we needed a path moving forward that was a we path. Take a look at the slide I think we might have it in there, uh, Zach. Uh, This is the graphic that we've used all throughout the series. And we said the goal is not an us or them, but it's a we. And a we that is not only reconciled vertically to God, but horizontally to one another. So that we can move forward, that enmity and estrangement 
can be set aside and unity restored. But I also said that we were going to address issues that are afoot in the battling for the very heart of Trinity Church. That sounds pretty melodramatic. I get that. But I want to assure you that it isn't. I chose to preach these first two messages that I ever preached at Trinity Church because I want to remind you this is what I presented myself as and what I came to do. I came to help you, help us, help me become more rooted, more growing in our relationships with Jesus and hence the message last week about the fatherhood of God and what he's called us into in relationship with him. And I also preach this message I preach today that I, want to lead a, lead, I wanted to lead us to be a people who are reaching our worlds, people who would be intentional about the influence that God has put us in with other people's lives. That was true five years ago when I was trying to demonstrate as clearly as I could who I am and the direction where I wanted to lead us, and it is still my heartbeat today. But you have to know this. At the desire to be intentional and purposeful to equip you to reach your worlds is not shared by everyone at Trinity. That desire to be that focused and to grow in a, in a church that has so many good things, such an incredible people resource, such an incredible spiritual maturity, decades of people who have walked with the Lord who have so much that we could share with other people, not only in our relational worlds, but when we bring them to this place and grow with them. But there are some who would say, we just want to keep doing it the way we've been doing it, and people are welcome to join us. And the reality is, that's not what I came to do. It's broken my heart being in different meetings in the last bit, hearing someone say that if people need to be reached, they can go to Citizens or Sandals. Someone saying to me personally one time, every time you talk about reaching, it's like nails on a chalkboard. These voices aren't many, but they're strong. And moving forward, I want to encourage you, we need to be a people who would say, God, we are sold out to the mission of Rooted and Reaching. We are a people who want to be growing, deepening in our relationship with you. And we want to be a people who are committed to be helping one another partner with you in the sharing of the gospel. So in that, what I want to encourage you to do, I want you to come back today. I want you to come back to our annual congregational meeting. And I want to encourage you to continue to support our elders who as a group have said to you numerous times, we believe this is the mission and the vision and the values that God has called Trinity Church to. We are all about them. Come out today and support them. Let me pray. Father, we come before you today as a people who, in our own lives, God, we have experienced so much. In our own lives, we have a richness of what it means to be reconciled to you because of what you have done for us at the cross, at the empty tomb. Things we could have never done on our own, but things we deeply needed you for. We're so grateful for that. Would you help us be a people who aren't just thrilled about what you've done for us, but God, would we take that enthusiasm? Would we take that trading our lives for your agenda? Would we be intentional to be on mission moving forward? Would we be that church? If you're here today, and you are maybe hearing for the first time, or maybe you've heard it before, but you've never responded to this great message of the reconciliation that God has done in our lives through Christ, then I want to encourage you to respond to it before you ever take another step. A, admit. Admit that you're a sinner who needs a Savior. B, believe. Believe that this Jesus we talked about today, he lived a sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. He was raised supernaturally on the third day. Believe that what Jesus did covers you, your guilt, your shame. And see is choose. Choose today to say, Jesus, I put my confidence, my hope, my trust in who you are. I want to live my life following Jesus' example. You can make that decision right here, right now, before you go anywhere. My prayer is that you wouldn't let another day go by until you do. 
be reconciled to God. Father, we love you and we pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen.